Welcome to this course on technology and the psyche. My name is Tom Lane, and I have been teaching for a number of years in the humanities program at Pacifica. Uh, my own academic background is that I have a doctorate in comparative literature from Yale, and I've spent most of my career in business, in the enterprise, uh, including uh, the film business for quite some time, and also developing media and content for the web. So what is technology and what is the psyche? Uh, here uh, you see both the words techne and psuche uh, in both Greek and Latin script. Uh, psuche uh, originally meant breath and came to be associated with the soul. Uh, the words for breath and soul or, or spirit are uh, frequently the same in many languages. Uh, techne, uh, we usually think of as something quite mechanical, but in its original sense uh, in ancient Greek, techne meant craft or art, and the English term technique uh, represents this. So just as psychology is the study of the psyche, so technology is the study of techne meaning craft or art. This module in the course deals with technological alienation, and I think it's uh, unmistakable that at times, sometimes frequently, technology tends to have an alienating effect in our everyday lives. Uh, it tends to prevent us from accessing the uh, deeper aspects of our psyche. But the relationship is actually a lot more complex and interesting than that. And the complexity of that relationship is one of the main themes of the course. To oversimplify things, um, most of the readings this week uh, propose the opinion that technology is bad and the psyche is good and that they're opposed to one another. The symbol you see before you, the Greek letter Ki, or X, uh, is also a symbol of chiasmus, which is a rhetorical figure in which opposites are combined or intermixed with one another. One of the premises of the course, with which you may or may not agree, is that, uh, yes, technology and the psyche are sometimes opposed to one another. Sometimes they support one another. Sometimes they do a very uh, interesting combination of both, and certainly they can transform one another. Very much to the point is that techne, as a craft or art, has uh, archetypal foundations. We start the readings with some selections from Carl Jung himself. Uh, these are collected in a volume called The Earth Has a Soul, C.G. Jung on Nature, Technology, and Modern Life. Towards the end of these selections, Jung says, considered on its own merits as a legitimate human activity, technology is neither good nor bad, neither harmful nor harmless. Whether it be used for good or ill depends entirely on man's own attitude, which in turn depends on technology. This is a perfectly reasonable statement, but it is belied by uh, much of what Jung says elsewhere uh, in the excerpts you're going to be reading. For instance, he says, all time-saving devices, amongst which we must count easier means of communication and other conveniences, do not, paradoxically enough, save us time, but merely cram our time so full that we have no time for anything. And really, who hasn't? felt that way uh, in this age of computers and the internet and smartphones. He also says that the tempo of the development of consciousness through science and technology was too rapid and left the unconscious, which could no longer keep up with it, far behind, thereby forcing it into a defensive position, which expresses itself in a universal will to destruction. Those are pretty strong words with which I imagine most of us could agree, uh, at least in part. And much of the reading this week, in fact, deals with the effects of technology on consciousness. Consciousness being, of course, very closely related to what we call the psyche. 
Jung basically comes right out and says that in his opinion and observation that technology leads to a quote-unquote loss of soul. In such a dialectical opposition, it's only a matter of time before things get carried away. The machines which we have invented, Jung says, are now our masters. Machines are running away with us. They are demons. They are like those huge old saurians that existed when man was a sort of lizard monkey and deadly afraid of their hooting and brooding. Jung goes on to say, look at the city of New York. Nobody can tell me that man feels like a king in New York. He is just an ant on an ant heap and doesn't count at all. He is superfluous there. The ant heap is the thing that counts. It is a town which should be inhabited by giants. Jung talks about an age when the machine gets on top of us, then it would become a dragon, the equivalent of the old Saurians. And really, when you look at New York, it is really on top of man. He knows that he has done it all, and yet it pulls him down. He compares this process with the creation of the golem, which you see here in a still from the 1915 horror film, The Golem, uh, written and directed by Paul Wegner, a film really very well worth seeing. Jung says, the old rabbi was capable of making a living thing, the golem, from a clod of earth by black magic. But that thing had a tendency to grow and grow, and finally it fell on him and killed him. What's interesting here is that the golem was really created by a form of esoteric or psychic technology, the Kabbalah, or alchemy, that so intrigued Jung. And I think it's here that the interrelationship between uh, technology and the psyche, with all its pros and cons, becomes really quite interesting. A little more close to the bone, Jung also says, technology harbors no more dangers than any other trend in the development of human consciousness. The danger lies not in technology, but in the possibilities awaiting discovery. Undoubtedly, a new discovery will never be used only for good, but certainly will be used for ill as well. Man, therefore, always runs the risk of discovering something that will destroy him if evilly used. We have come very close to this with the atom bomb. And the symbol and the reality of the atom bomb provides us with a good segue into our next set of readings, which are from Robert Ruminishin's book, Technology as Symptom and Dream. Ruminishin's book uh, returns time and time again to the atom bomb as well as the astronaut as symbols of and symptoms and dreams of the alienation brought about by technology. This book was written in 1989, and I think if it were written or revised today, uh, the symbols would be changed from the bomb and the astronaut to the computer, the smartphone, and global warming. This book also contains a number of great illustrations, the only unfortunate thing being that they're not in color. So I'm going to show you here a few of the most uh, important illustrations in our readings uh, in living color. Jung talks about technology as a trend in the development of human consciousness. This is a theme that Romanition takes up uh, in detail and at length with technology being seen as a cause or impetus for changes in human consciousness uh, that all have not always been for the better. He's very much influenced by the art historian Samuel Edgerton, who wrote a great deal about uh, the advent of artistic linear perspective, how it became the trademark of Renaissance artistic realism, and then how such perspectival art allowed uh, Galileo, among other people, to see scientifically for the first time the supposedly true form of our universe. Romanition stresses the importance of the shift from unperspectival or non-perspectival art, such as is seen in this medieval uh, depiction of the city of Florence, with uh, art in which 
perspective plays a part, perspectival art. By way of contrast, we have from not too much later in time, this perspectival view uh, of the city of Florence, taken from the perspective of the man in the uh, lower right-hand corner, which shows a whole new way of seeing the world, a new Weltanschauung, or worldview, as the Germans would say, one very much associated with the techno-scientific revolution led by such figures as Galileo and Isaac Newton, who interestingly was also extremely interested in such esoteric uh, subjects as alchemy. What Romanition contends is that with uh, the Renaissance, there came to be a whole new way of viewing the world, a perspectival view, in which the self is turned more into a spectator, distanced from the world, rather than uh, more of a participant in the world, as was the case in the previous illustration, which is all sort of tactile, jumbled together, gives more of a sense of being in the city. Here we are outside uh, looking uh, down at the city. Uh, a similar assertion is made by Jean Gebser, the uh, German-Swiss historian of uh, consciousness and culture, in his masterpiece with the wonderful title, The Ever-Present Origin. Uh, he is really the one who brought in the terms unperspectival, uh, say that five times fast, and perspectival. To what degree do worldviews, uh, especially of different cultures, uh, change and evolve? How are they different from one another? Uh, it's a fascinating question and, and actually one which I think is more in question now than it ever has been. The long accepted assertion of the linguist Benjamin Worf that people with different languages see the world in different ways has now come uh, very much uh, under question. To me, it uh, seems undeniable that consciousness uh, does change and evolve, if you want to put it that way. And it's fascinating to study the history of these changes. I also personally find it important to realize that there are, in fact, more radical ways of looking at uh, the truth value of our individual worldviews, our uh, views of self and world. To dwell probably too briefly on the Buddhist perspective of what are called the aggregates uh, or heaps, or in uh, Sanskrit, the skandhas, our self is said to form by clinging to five different types of appearances, which are false to fact, but uh, arise at the same time. Actually, what's really false to fact is identifying uh, with them as I, me, or mine. These are the actual physicality, the form or matter of uh, what we're encountering. Uh, the awareness or consciousness of that encounter, uh, which comes through uh, the sense gates. The Vedana or feeling uh, that co-arise with that, whether we're finding the experience pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. The automatic perception or cognition of what it is we may be perceiving, like that's a dog, that's a tree, that's my enemy. And then the sankharas, uh, the volitional or mental formations that cause us to act in reaction or response to that which we perceive. So in this uh, radical view, the sense of self which arises in either an unperspectival worldview or a perspectival worldview is fictional or false to fact. We create and highly identify with a self that isn't really there. The point here, uh, more or less, is that our sense of self, of who we are, and our worldview really are uh, co-created and interdependent. 
moving back to uh, Ramanishan's book, uh, he spends quite a while uh, describing the theory of perspective as developed by this fellow, Leon Battista Alberti, a true Renaissance man of 15th century Florence who was an architect as well as a theoretician and poet. Again, it uh, can't really be stressed too much that the point of view being uh, set forth here is that the scientific objectifying worldview and uh, the, the sense of artistic perspective or the practice of artistic perspective uh, actually arose in conjunction with one another and reflect one another. Romanition again illustrates this point with two contrasting paintings. Uh, the first one is uh, Bosch's The Temptation of St. Anthony in which what we might think of as psychic uh, or today feel our internal struggles uh, are represented at the time and by a brilliant artist of the time as externalized in an unperspectival sense with psyche and world commingling. This is contrasted with Goya's uh, much later painting, The Sleep of Reason, in which uh, the angels and demons which were externalized in Bosch have moved uh, to an internal space in the Goya. Romanition goes on to emphasize how the culmination of the perspectival worldview is mechanical as uh, represented by the mechanical art of photography, but then also goes on to discuss the painter David Hockney's very interesting works in collage type photography, photography that might be called multi-perspectival as opposed to perspectival. Gene Gebser in The Ever-Present Origin calls this a perspectival rather than unperspectival or perspectival, signaling a new way of looking at the world built on Shang associated with such modern artists as Picasso and Joyce and moving into the present day. What you just saw was Hockney's photo collage called uh, The Merced River, which is in Romanition's book. This is an equally great photo collage from the same period called Pear Blossom Highway. Here's perhaps my favorite Hockney photo collage of a Zen garden in Kyoto. And in my opinion, uh, Romanition doesn't fully explore the implications of what he's putting uh, forward here in terms of more recent and current changes in our sense of self or psyche that are interrelated with technology. But we'll certainly do a lot more of that later uh, in the course as the course goes, goes on. However, Romanition does explore more recent developments in somewhat more depth uh, in the section beginning on page 71 in which there are a few references to this gentleman, the French phenomenologist Merleau-Ponty, who lived from 1908 to 1961. Both Merleau-Ponty and Martin Heidegger, who's also mentioned, were students of the German philosopher Edmund Husserl, who is generally considered the founder of phenomenology, which can be defined as the philosophical study of the structure of experience. It's a philosophical approach that tries to create conditions to uh, study topics objectively that are usually regarded as subjective, such as consciousness, judgments, perceptions, emotions. Uh, but this study isn't uh, clinical or neurological. It's a way of systematically reflecting upon our own subjective experience in order to determine its properties and structures. And in this way, uh, I find that it's really very closely uh, related, in technique at least, uh, to Buddhist mindfulness practice. Uh, it's interesting to note that Jung, uh, in fact, described himself as a phenomenologist, although this 
self-description hasn't really uh, received much uh, investigation or discussion. I've assigned you uh, another section later in Ramanishan's book in which he discusses the shadow's manifestations, that is the manifestations of the shadow that has been repressed in the scientific perspectival worldview. Many of these emerge as uh, feminine symbols, the witch, uh, the hysteric, the anorexic. One of the most powerful such symbols was created by a woman, uh, Mary Shelley, uh, and that's Frankenstein. I do uh, love the film starring Karloff, but if you haven't read uh, the original by Mary Shelley, uh, you really owe it to yourself to do so. It's a masterpiece. If we had the time, uh, I would have liked to have studied it in this course, actually. Uh, and if you do read it, please uh, make sure to read the 1818 edition, not the later, somewhat uh, butlerized edition. Frankenstein is very much like the golem uh, whom we saw earlier, but in the case of Frankenstein, he's created through scientific and medical technology as opposed to the esoteric Kabbalistic technology by which the golem is created or was created. But as uh, I hope uh, to show as the course progresses, these two forms of technology ha certainly have as much in common as they have that is not in common. Thematically, I just uh, wanted to conclude uh, the lecture with an early image from uh, the photographer Cindy Sherman, a photographer whose subject is herself. She takes selfies, uh, as people today would put it, of herself in, generally in costume and very dramatic poses, treating herself both as subject and object simultaneously uh, in ways that have really very uh, great artistic and psychic impact, using the technology of photographer, rather of photography, to create a self or psyche that's really quite flexible and unfixed.